Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about what happened in January 2020 in paleontology. Allosaurus is one of the most famous genera of dinosaurs, with one specimen being even the focus of a single documentary by BBC, that specimen being Big Al. Many of the studies on Big Al have been on the injuries that it had, with 19 of the bones showing different amounts of healing and damage over the course of the animal's lifespan. But many of these researchers also thought that Big Al wasn't quite like the other Allosaurus fragilis, which is the most common kind coming from the Morris information. Finally, a new study has been able to look at the different Allosaurus fossils and has found a new species of Allosaurus, with Big Al being one of these. The new paper didn't look at Big Al specifically as the type specimen of this new species, but instead looked at a new dinosaur coming from Dinosaur National Park. The new Allosaurus species has been named Allosaurus Jim Madseni. Part of what makes Allosaurus Jim Madseni so unique is its exact placement within the Morrison Formation, coming from the salt wash member of that formation. Meanwhile, the more commonly found Allosaurus fragilis has been shown to only come from the newer brushy basin member, meaning that Allosaurus fragilis is slightly later in time than Allosaurus Jim Madseni. This could potentially represent an ancestral relationship of Allosaurus gymanseni to Allosaurus fragilis. The study also looked at some of the other species of Allosauruses, and found them to be far fewer than we had previously thought. Some of these species were even named by some of the authors of this paper, and so they were essentially cancelling out their own naming of certain species. What the paper found is that the main species that are more confirmed to exist and have better evidence to support their existence are Allosaurus fragilis, Allosaurus gymnadseni, the new one named, and Allosaurus europus, which is from Europe. The reduction of species within Allosaurus can help to indicate how important it is to look at every possible fossil when doing these kind of cladistic studies that help us understand just how diverse a certain species or genus may have been, and how just looking at one or two specimens doesn't really give us the whole picture. During the early Jurassic 183 million years ago, South Africa, and particularly South Africa's Karoo Basin, experienced some trap volcanism as the continents began to split apart. This would lead to massive basalt plains and floods sweeping across large parts of the land. But in between these basalt floods which periodically erupted, the sands and waters would be able to return. And that's because the water would bring the sands with it. Preserved in these sand lenses wedged between basalts, are footprints of the animals that would have lived in between these eruptions. Some of the footprints preserved in these sandstones come from animals like Coelophysis, which, while not confirmed in this exact time period, does appear in the fossil record a few million years earlier in South Africa. It also preserves some of the footprints from the synapsids, which would have been the ancestors to the mammals. In fact, the footprints show that as you get later and later into the formation, the mammaliform synapsids became the most successful, potentially indicating how mammals may have become as dominant as they are today, even while they weren't dominant during the Jurassic or the later Cretaceous. Pterosaur diets have often been assumed to be things like small fish and squid, and it's been very hard to confirm this. Occasionally you will find things like a fish inside of a pterosaur, but that's very rare. But this time we found something even more rare, and that's a pterosaur tooth inside of a squid. Coming from the Solnhofen limestone in Germany, Plesiotuthis was shown to have had a Rhamphorhynchus tooth embedded in it when it died. This does mean that the pterosaur likely still did enough damage to kill the squid, but it just wasn't able to actually catch and eat the thing. Rhamphorhynchus has often been one of the most thought of species as being one of these squid eaters, with its long interlocking teeth being hypothesized as something that would be able to hold something like a squid. And that does seem to be the case, even though this squid got away, although the injury it sustained probably caused it to die very quickly after. But that also allowed it to be preserved in the fossil record so well. Having harder evidence of the exact paleobiological interactions that were happening between different clades, such as this pterosaur eating a squid, could potentially help us understand why certain groups died out and thrived depending on which one they were, such as the Belemnites dying out while the squid survived. Noosaurs are some of the lesser known theropod dinosaurs. They aren't as flashy or big as things like the raptors 
or as Tyrannosaurus rex, respectively, and they're not related to the Allosauroids, or things like the Giganotosaurs. Instead, they're most closely related to the Ceratosaurs and Abelosaurs, and even then, they're still an outgroup to those more famous groups that contain animals like Ceratosaurus and Carnotaurus. In fact, the most known member of this clade is probably Masiachosaurus, which would have used its downturned jaws to hold on to small prey. It's unsure if all of the Noosaurs had the same downturned jaw, but it would at least be some sort of niche that they would have been able to hold on to in many parts of the world, now including Australia. While there isn't enough material to assign a species or a genus to the Noosaur material coming out of Australia, there is enough to tell that it is a species of Noosaur, even if we can't exactly identify it. This finding helps to broaden our understanding of the theropod diversity in Australia, which had previously been limited basically to just animals like Australovenator, which is a Megaraptorian. However, because it's so partial, it also means there needs to be a lot more study done and a lot more research and searching for fossils done, so we can try and get an even better understanding of what exactly was happening in Cretaceous Australia. Tyrannosaurs are very often given over-the-top names, such as things like Dynamoterror, found in 2018, and this trend continues in 2020. Thanotherestes digrutorum, which the genus name translates to Reaper of Death in Greek. I personally find names like this absolutely ridiculous and a lot more childish than maybe other people do. It sounds to me more like a bad villain name from some B fantasy movie rather than a dinosaur, and that's largely because this kind of name doesn't help to convey anything about the animal. I don't necessarily know anything other than it was a big carnivore with this kind of name, and that's very disappointing. It doesn't even give anything about the place it was found. But there is hope it might be able to be renamed. And that's because many people have looked at the paper suggesting Thanotherestes as its own genus and thought to themselves, it's actually just another species of Despladiosaurus, which is still very cool. Having a new species of large theropod coming from the late Cretaceous does help our understanding of how exactly the Tyrannosaurs were able to evolve into one of the most massive land predators of all time in Tyrannosaurus rex. What this means is that Thanotherestes decrutorum could potentially be renamed as Despladiosaurus decrutorum, which is a much more manageable name, and I would really appreciate it if Tyrannosaur researchers would stop jumping the gun on completely outlandish names. Impacts from space are known in the geologic record, with many craters having been found, including Meteor Crater near me in Arizona and the Chicxulub Crater which likely was the impactor that killed the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. One such hypothesized crater in Australia has been very hard to date, but new uranium testing shows that it might actually be one of the oldest craters known. The uranium testing on zircons indicates that this crater might be over 2.2 billion years old, making it the oldest known, and also coinciding with a significant period of climate change. The heat that was caused by this impact may have helped some of the snowball earth type environments to have the glaciers recede, and could have helped warm the planet during the Great Oxygenation event, where stromatolites and other cyanobacteria began to photosynthesize, releasing massive amounts of oxygen into the atmosphere. This oxygen would then later allow life to start breathing the atmosphere, as well as it was oxygenating the oceans as well. This impact combined with the Great Oxygenation event could have been a spark that helped lead to the diversity of life we have today, with many primitive members of many of our current kingdoms and large clades developing during this time period. With many of these early clades, it's important to realize that the fungus are actually closer to animals than they are to plants. They breathe the same way that we do. They take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Showing when exactly these clades started to diverge, though, is hard to do, but a new study seeks to do just that. Fibrous materials in some Precambrian rocks that could be anywhere from 810 to 715 million years old potentially have the key to some of the first fungi. What they show is something very similar to many of the filaments that modern fungus use when moving through a substrate in order to find nutrients. Chemically, the rocks also showed chemical traces of chitin, the building blocks that fungus use to build up their bodies. What this could mean is that we have a new trace of the oldest known fungus, which could then help us understand how they developed even further on down the line, 
through the Precambrian and even into the Paleozoic. And this is because fungus fossils aren't exactly wildly common. And so when we do have them, it is important to study them in as great of detail as possible because there's just so many fewer of them. Some authors have described the KPG extinction as kind of a whodunit murder mystery. There's been a lot of debate over whether it was the Deccan traps erupting with their trap volcanism being one of the main causes of climate change that would have then killed off many of the species at the end of the Cretaceous. Others have suggested that it was very much the Chicxulub crater that killed off the dinosaurs and other species. A new study suggests that yes, it was the meteor, and this is in line with a few other studies over the past few years. This particular study looked at the carbon cycle. There's many small plankton that live in the oceans, and when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and become incorporated into what is effectively the soil. Then, animals either filtering out for these or plants then absorb that carbon and bring that carbon back into the oceans. The Deccan traps have the potential to disturb this by releasing a massive amount of carbon dioxide during their eruptions. What the researchers found is that there's a very distinctive start and end to the first set of eruptions that occurs before the impact, and that life goes on pretty much as normal after the end of those eruptions. It's only after the impact that we see a disruption of the carbon cycle, as many of these small organisms that lived in the oceans began to die off in mass. What this means is it is still very much more likely that the impact is what caused the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, rather than the Deccan traps, which are very slowly losing much more of their sway in the argument of what exactly caused this extinction. Pterosaur trackways aren't entirely unknown, although most of them have a bias towards the short-tailed pterosaurs, animals more like pterodactylus. That's what makes these new trackways so unique. What they show is that these long-tailed pterosaurs were actually fairly comfortable on the ground. Some researchers had suggested that since we weren't finding these kinds of trackways, the long-tailed pterosaurs likely didn't go on the ground very often. For example, the fifth toe of these pterosaurs helps to support an inner membrane that stretched between the legs, and many researchers have suggest that this membrane would have been caught up and caused the animal not to be able to move as well. Because of this, some researchers have suggested different ideas of what this toe might have done when the animal was on the ground, and things have mostly been limited to things like they would just hold it up in order to try and keep it away from the ground, or potentially they would try and wrap it around the leg, just so that the different membrane that was on the legs wouldn't be as caught up and likely to get caught as the animal was walking. But these fossils show that's not the case, and that researchers were, for the most part, overthinking it. Rather than lifting it up or wrapping it around the leg, they would just leave it on the ground, and there was enough material on the bone and on the toe to keep the membrane still off the ground and provide enough support for the animal to help it walk. It also helps to show how the different hand positions would have occurred in the different pterosaur clades. The short-tailed pterosaurs mostly kept their hands sideways as they walked, with the long pinky that supported the wing membrane being kept up and behind. And while this is still somewhat true for these long-tailed pterosaurs, they would have still kept their main toes forward and the pinky even more folded in order to help keep it out of the way. And that's why we should never overlook trace fossils like footprints. These trace fossils do a very good job of helping us understand what exactly the different behaviors of these animals would have been. And even when they're rare, can help us understand much more about an entire clade, especially when compared to the trace fossils of clades that are very closely related, but not identical to it. Nanotyrannus has been controversial ever since it was described in 1988. Differences in skull shape, the number of teeth, and a number of other things have caused it to have been grouped separately from Tyrannosaurus rex, which also comes from the same formations, particularly the Hill Creek Formation. The main argument against the existence of Nanotyrannus has been the idea that a lot of these changes and differences we see between Nanotyrannus and Tyrannosaurus rex are the result of ontogeny, which is just the changes the animal goes through as it ages. What the researchers suggest is that as the animal aged, it would lose some of the teeth and the skull shape would very much broaden and deepen, allowing it to get the bone-crushing bite of Tyrannosaurus rex. And a new study suggests that this is the case, that Nanotyrannus is actually just a juvenile T. rex. A few specimens that are known to be juvenile T. rex were studied in this paper, and their bones were essentially cut into slices and then examined so that they could count the rings as these animals would lay down essentially 
a new ring of bone growth every year. This helps us to understand the age of the animal, which puts the two specimens studied at about 13 to 15 years old. And it also helps to show that while they were still young, some of them were developing some of these more derived, older characteristics that are more resembling of the Tyrannosaurus rex adults. Combined with other studies on Tyrannosaurus rex growth, what it does suggest is that Nanotyrannus very much didn't exist. And all the specimens of Nanotyrannus that we have are actually just juvenile T-Rex. And this even comes down to the original author who named it, Backer, who did suggest there was a potential ability for it to be just a juvenile T-Rex. But the evidence wasn't there at that time, particularly as cutting bones in half wasn't as popular of an idea for study back in 1888 when the animal was described. This kind of in-depth bone study can really help us understand how exactly these animals grew and help us to understand exactly what the relationships to other animals in the environment may have been. Wulong bohayensis is a new species of microraptorine dromaeosaur coming from the Jahol biota of China. This species hasn't been described before, and the specimen found does represent a juvenile. However, this juvenile already had two very long tail feathers, and this is a very unique adaptation. What it means is that these feathers likely weren't used for display, which is something you would expect to develop more in an adult animal than a juvenile. What this could mean is that they were trying to function potentially somewhat like a pygo style, which the dromaeosaurs didn't have. In the birds, a pygo style allows for a fan of feathers to develop at the end of the tail. But because they didn't have this pygo style instead of normal tail, there would have been a distinctive notch in all dromaeosaurs' tails where they couldn't grow feathers at the exact tip of the tail. What these feathers may have done is help to act as a kind of pseudo pygo style, helping the animal control itself while gliding through the forests of ancient China. This, combined with the long flight feathers, helps to suggest that the microraptorine dinosaurs were very much ready for very advanced and rapid development, with the animal being only about a year old when it died, but already having these very unique traits to help it fly. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. We have a website now and we have a Patreon. So if you're interested in either of those, please click the links down below. The uh, website has some different blogs and articles that I write that aren't necessarily gonna be filmed. And we try and keep a weekly thing up of some of the stuff that's happening in paleontology. Not all of those articles will get into my monthly reviews. So if you're looking for more stuff, feel free to go there. And then we might be launching a store soon, which will have some of my wife's drawings that she's done that are more comic-like and should hopefully be very good. Be safe and take care and don't go extinct.